last time, basically what we did is we started out by showing that we can use NAND or AND or NOT to compute any finite function, any finite function at all. We can do with NANDs or AND or NOT gates. And we started this discussion of showing how we could have some function that basically simulates programs. That we could write a function where the input to the function is going to be like a program and an input for that program, an input for the program. And our output is going to be what would happen if we ran that program on that input. So we can define a function that does this. Programs uh, in the way that we describe them are going to be of finite length. The input is going to be of finite length, so this is going to be a finite function. We should be able to have some circuit which implements this function of doing what the program is supposed to do. What we started with last class is talking about exactly what that function might look like, how we could define that function. And our idea was to look at how programs end up getting run to help us to implement this function. And the way that your computer is going to run programs is essentially when you hit run on your, on your computer, you're going to have this table. And in this table, you're going to have like a list of all the variables, one variable per row. And then you're going to have the value of each of those variables. And essentially what you do is you, in this table, just fill in all of the values of the variables, like maybe A is 0 and then B is 1. And then as you go through the lines of your program, you can start to update the values of all those variables are going to be until eventually you get to the return. And then that tells you what you should be returning from this function. This is basically how your computers execute functions. And we're going to make a circuit which does this same idea for executing a function. So the first thing that we're going to need to do in order to implement this function is we need to talk about how we can actually represent our programs as bits. We need to give the program as an input to a circuit. That means since circuits can only take bits as input, we need to figure out how can we represent a program as bits. So in this case, the program that we're going to be talking about is going to be NAND straight line. The reason that we're going to be talking about NAND straight line is because it's equivalent to something like AND or NOT. It's universal, and there's only one kind of operation that we really have to worry about. We only have NANDs, which is going to make things really simple for us, or much simpler at least. We're going to start with a NAND straight line program. And we're going to come up with a way to convert that NAND straight line program into a bunch of bits. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to first represent our program as a list of triples of natural numbers. We're just going to have triples of numbers that represent that program. And then we could take that triple of numbers and maybe convert that to bits. Because we know how to take numbers and convert those into bits. So this is our idea. We're going to take our program, written in NAND straight line, convert it to a bunch of numbers, convert those numbers to binary strings, and now we have a binary string for that program. Every single line in a NAND straight line program has this form where we have a variable, and then we have the equal sign, and then we have NAND, and then we have two more variables. Every single line looks like that. There's a lot of details that are in that line that I don't necessarily need to fill in because they're just always the same. For instance, I could leave out the equal sign. And if I just had temp1 NAND AA, then it would not be too difficult for us to understand that temp1 was going to take on the value of doing NAND on A with A. That's sort of extraneous. That's nice for readability, but it's not totally necessary. I could also get rid of the NAND. If we're doing NAND straight line, NAND is the only operation we're allowed to do. So if I just say temp1 AA, then I could just understand that the last two things I'm doing a NAND on and then assigning that to the first thing. So this means that I could do something like rewrite or as temp1 AA, temp2BB, return temp1, temp2. We could easily understand that as exactly the same program we started with before. We could also get rid of fancy meaningful variable names and I could just number my variables instead. So I could say that A is 0, and B is 1, and temp1, well, that's going to be 2, and then temp2 is going to be 3. This return thing, that's going to be 4. So instead of having nice readable variables, I could just number them instead. If we number our variables and get rid of the stuff that's just always the same, 
we can represent each line of this program as just three numbers. This line becomes 200, zero, zero, which means I'm going to assign as the value of variable 2 the result of doing a NAND with the value of variable 0 with the value of variable 0. And then this line says I'm going to assign as the value to variable 3 the result of doing the NAND on the value of variable 1 with the value of variable 1. So essentially what we've done is we've taken this table that we talked about your computer sort of has while it's running your code. So we have this table where we've got the variables and then their values, and we're essentially saying each variable gets a number. And then we're going to end up having a table where that table is going to represent the value of the variables in order of their number. So this list of triples, we can think of that as now representing or. All right, so all I've done is number the variables and recognize that just listing, my ver listing three variables in some order, I can understand that as being assigned to the first one, the NAND of the second two. That's how this works, yes. So step one is we're going to number each variable where the first n variables go to the input. When we're going to be implementing this function, so this function that's going to be running programs for us, the function is going to be this eval n, m, and s where n is going to represent the number of input bits, m is going to represent the number of output, and s is going to represent the number of lines. The reason we're doing this is because since we're using a circuit, it has to be a finite function. So we have to sort of pick the number of input bits we're going to have in advance. In order to actually write down the function, we need to know exactly the number of input bits we're going to use. Since we are giving the input that's going to go to the program as one of the inputs to the eval function, we need to know how big the input is. So we know how many of the bits go to the input. Since we're giving a description of the program, we need to know how big the program is going to be. We have to pick a size of the program in order to be able to take that program as input. Uh, also, we need to know how many bits we're going to be returning, so we need to know the size of the output of that program. So we're actually going to have a slightly different eval function for programs of different sizes or programs with different numbers of inputs or outputs. So if you change any of those one things, you're going to need a different eval program to do that. The first n variables we're going to say are like our parameters for this function. Those are where the inputs to the function are coming from, are the first n variables. The last m, we're going to say those were the output bits. The last m variables, their values, you kind of concatenate them together in order, and that's your output. We can represent every single line of our program as three numbers, and we, we can represent the entire program as the number of inputs, and then the number of outputs, and then the list of the lines as our triples here. So these three things describe our program for us. That gives us exactly the same information that we would get here. So in this case, n is going to be 2, m is going to be 1, and then our list of lines are over here. So everything that was in the nice Python-looking code is also present in just this kind of triple, where one of the triples is a list of triples. So let's look at how we can do this with XOR. So with XOR, what is n? What is n for XOR? 2. We have two input bits. What is m? 1, we have one output bit for XOR. What is S? S is the number of lines that are in our program. So what is S? S is going to be 4 in this case. So now let's look at how we can represent our XOR as bits. All of the variables that we're going to see throughout need to go in our table. So we have, for instance, A, we have B, we have U, V, W, and then like return. And now we're just going to give them all a number. So A gets 0, B gets 1, U gets 2, V gets 3, W gets 4, return gets 5. So now I can represent each of these lines as a triple of three numbers. So U is 2, so the first number in this triple is going to be 2. because That's the variable we're assigning things into. And which variables are we doing the NAND on in order to make that assignment? Well, that's A, which is 0, and then B, which is 1. So that triple represents the first line. The next line, we have v, which is variable 3, being assigned the value of doing the XOR of a, which has value 0, and u, which is variable 2. 
and then W, well that's variable 4. That gets the, the result of doing the NAND with B, which is variable 1, and U, which is variable 2. And then the thing I return is the last variable, which is variable 5. Uh, and uh, this value is going to be the result of doing the NAND with D, which is variable 3, and W, which is variable 4. So this list of triples represents the, the source code of that program, so to speak. Okay, so now let's look at how many bits it is that we're going to require in order to represent this program. Yeah, so how many bits does it take for me to represent n in this situation, where n is 2? How many bits does that take? Yeah, 2. Yeah, peace. So we're going to have uh, the, the number of bits we need to represent n, which is going to be 2 bits for n, plus the number of bits that's, that it's going to take to represent m. How many bits is that? One, so that's one bit for m, plus the number of bits it takes to represent all of my lines of code. So this is kind of the complicated part. How many bits do we need to represent all of the lines of code? Each line of code is going to be three numbers long. So we're certainly going to have a three in here. And then also, we have s triples that we need to represent. That's how we defined s. So this is going to be three times s times, and then the number of bits we needed to represent each variable. How many bits do I need to represent each variable? Okay, so let's say that I'm going to use the same number of bits to represent every variable. Okay, so how many bits do I need in that situation? Yes. It depends on how many variables I have. What's the maximum number of variables I can have? Let's say that I have s lines. What's the maximum number of variables I can have? So it's going to be s plus n, because every return is going to have kind of its own line. So the number of returns is kind of going to already be, be captured by, by our choice of s here. So we don't need to add in m, but we do need to add in n, the number of inputs. So it's the number of inputs plus the number of lines is going to be that. If the maximum number of variables I can have is n plus s, how many bits do I need to represent them if all of them are the same length? Yeah. Yeah, so this is going to now be the ceiling of the log base 2 of n plus s is the number of bits I'll need for that. So if we have a set of n plus s things, the question is, how many bits are we going to need to uniquely represent everything in that set? Uh, with a bit string of the same size. So in this case, that's going to be the, the log of the number of things in the set. So basically, to summarize what we're doing here, the first thing that we need to do when we, when we represent our program as bits, we're going to need to number each variable, so each variable gets some sort of number. The number of variables, so the number of variables, we said was going to be equal to n plus s. So we're going to have n plus s variables in here. So that means that to number each variable, we're going to need the ceiling of the log base 2 of n plus s bits each. And then we're going to represent each line as three numbers. So we have 3 times s times the length of the variables for that. So 3 times s times however long our variable representation was. We have s lines. Each line had three numbers. And we needed log base 2 of n plus s bits per line. And then we can represent our program as n, m, and then that list of lines. And this is going to be 2 times the log uh, base 2 of s. If we work all of this out, we know that an upper bound for the size of our program is going to be, we'll just round this to 4s log s. We can just get rid of this and things are still going to hold. Uh, you can do sort of the arithmetic on your own if you want to. But if you look at like the fact that n is going to have to be less than or equal to s, because we can't have fewer inputs than lines if we're going to have all of the lines depend on the input. Right? If we have all of the line, if we have every or every input be used in the body of the function, then we need to have at least as many lines as inputs. So if we make that assumption, then basically we can say that an upper bound for s of s is the size of the program of s lines in bits is what s of s represents. We can say that an upper bound for that is basically for s log s, something like that. Yeah. 
the book is going to have more details. I'm trying to gloss over some details. But what, what we're going to work with for now is that the number of bits required for our program is going to be upper bounded by, let's say, four times the number of lines times log of the number of lines. But intuitively, this is going to be approximately what our answer ought to be. We're going to have like three numbers per line. There are S lines. And then we're going to have about log s things per line. And then there's some extra noise we had in there. So what I did is I just increased that 3 to a 4 to account for that noise and make things easy.